It's been a while since we heard any major news with Google's Daydream VR platform, but the launch of the Lenovo Mirage Solo and Mirage Camera give Daydream the leap forward it needs and provides a wholly new way of experiencing mobile VR that we really haven't been able to see yet. What makes the Mirage Solo so special? Inside-out tracking? truly standalone operation, and absolutely zero configuration required for anything. If you haven't heard of Inside Out Tracking yet, there's probably a good reason for that. While conceptually it's been around for a while, we haven't had many VR headsets that have embedded the technology just yet. The Mirage Solo aims to change that though, as it's a standalone VR headset that not only doesn't require any phone to power it or provide input, but also doesn't need cameras or other external room sensors to be installed, all while offering the full 6 degrees of freedom movement that more expensive headsets offer. While the $399 price tag certainly is a bit tough to buy off when comparing to Oculus Go's literal half price 199 tag, the spec and capability boosts certainly look to be the big payoff here. Powered by a Snapdragon 835 chipset, 4 gigs of RAM, and a 4000 milliamp hour battery, it's significantly more capable than the Oculus Go, which sports a Snapdragon 821, 3 gigs of RAM, and a 2600 milliamp hour battery. It's 175 grams heavier though, totaling 645 grams, and sits at the top of the stack for heaviest VR headsets out there. Thankfully, Lenovo has engineered a capable and comfortable headset to distribute the weight, making this feel nowhere near as heavy as it sounds. It's also super easy to put on, going hand in hand with the ease that a standalone headset should have. I didn't really care for the design of the nose rest though, which oftentimes felt like it was squeezing my nose far too tight for comfort, but on the bright side, there's literally zero light leakage from the outside world, so you're 100% immersed in VR once that headset is on. The headset does adjust forward and back to leave room for glasses, or in case your head is a slightly different shape than somebody else's. There's an occupancy sensor inside that detects when the headset is actually on your head and automatically wakes the device up or turns the screen off and puts it to sleep when you take the headset off. It's attention to detail like this that makes the Mirage Solo feel a little bit magical and keeps your mind off micromanaging every little nuance of the operation and onto the actual VR content. Inside the headset is a pair of Fresnel lenses with 110 degree field of view, or one of the widest in the industry, and the clever placement of ventilation at the top means these won't get as foggy the way most VR headsets tend to get in those first few minutes of use. It also means it's more comfortable during longer sessions since it gives your skin a way to actually breathe. The display under the lenses is an IPS LCD display, something not very common in VR headsets. Most headsets opt for OLED displays instead because of the lower pixel persistence rate, which typically helps with motion sickness. Lenovo has sourced quad HD panels that are both high resolution and sport 75 hertz refresh rates to keep the action smooth, and despite the big difference in contrast between this and an OLED panel, the most important parts of VR are covered. One of the most surprising aspects is most certainly the sharpness level, which is achieved by a combination of the quad HD resolution and the fact that it's an RGB pixel structure on this display, which lessens the screen door effect considerably, taking your eyes off the individual pixels themselves and helping them just to focus on the VR content. While an RGB stripe OLED would probably provide better visual fidelity, these panels are very uncommon in the mobile world and are likely more expensive than what people would be willing to pay. Another incredibly important factor here is the refresh rate. At 75Hz, the Mirage Solo runs at a higher refresh rate than the 60Hz that most Daydream phones are capable of running, which helps keep the action smoother and again cut down on motion sickness. Google and Lenovo have clearly worked to implement some form of asynchronous space warp to keep the viewer movement frame rate separate from the actual content rendering frame rate. This means that the viewer movement, or the movement of your physical self in the virtual world, is always running at 75 frames per second, no matter what. While the content itself is allowed to drop in frame rate to guarantee that higher viewer frame rate. While the actual formula is probably way more complicated than this, the result is an experience that's smooth and agile even if the unit struggles to keep up with the content being rendered, which in the end is the most important part of keeping the person behind the headset from getting motion sickness. On average, while running the built-in performance monitor, we saw the frame rate of rendered content dip to as low as 45 frames per second, but most VR titles don't get anywhere near that and keep the frame rate well above 55 or 60 frames, and with the viewer frame rate separated from the content one, things always felt smooth even if the animations looked a little bit on the choppy side. Aside from not requiring a phone or computer to power the experience, the biggest differentiating factor between headsets like Oculus Go or Samsung Gear VR is that the Mirage Solo can completely track your movements in physical space without any external monitoring equipment, and it does this completely seamlessly without any setup or any need for drawing room boundaries. Lenovo's WorldSense camera sits on the front and sees the world around the headset, giving it the ability to map the room in real time. 
Google has also designed a clever chaperone system within Daydream OS that allows players to move around just a bit, duck, tilt your head, peer under objects, etc., but doesn't let you wander more than two feet or so from the starting point. Google's visual implementation of boundaries come in the form of a fade to black, where the screen will start to fade out if you venture too far in physical space, keeping you safely confined to the free space in your room. The additional degrees of freedom really make the VR experience come to life, and if you've ever used an HTC Vive or an Oculus Rift with room scale enabled, you'll understand how room scale VR truly changes everything. While enabled by default, these boundaries can actually be turned off if you'd like, but most games right now don't necessarily take advantage of extremely large spaces, so while it's certainly possible to roam farther, there's really no content for it. Oddly enough, the Daydream controller does not work with this new inside-out tracking, and unfortunately still features the same three axis limitations that it has on existing phones with Daydream capability. There's no hope of simply updating the controller to have better tracking though, so the only hope would be for an additional controller to come available with better tracking support. Google really needs to update Daydream's ability to support more advanced controllers, as these little things were fine two years ago when the platform launched, due to its simple nature in the first place, but mobile VR in particular has advanced way past this, as evidenced by Lenovo's WorldSense technology, while the controllers are clearly stuck in the 2006 era. Ultimately, it's the controller that presents the biggest limiting factor here, and really is a crying shame when you consider the possibilities that WorldSense and a completely self-contained Daydream VR headset bring to the table. Another issue with the controller is the burden of where exactly you put it while not in use. Google's original Daydream View had an ingenious design where the controller fit nicely inside the closed headset so that it doesn't get lost when taking the headset to go. There's just no place to put it here, and I already thought I lost the controller once, but thankfully had just fallen in between the couch cushions. Disaster narrowly averted there. The headset itself isn't really portable at all either, despite its standalone nature, for a number of obvious reasons at this point. It's quite large, made of rigid plastic, and doesn't fold up at all. Definitely a missed opportunity without a doubt. On the software side, Daydream OS powers the experience, which runs atop Android 8.0 Oreo, and offers a 100% VR experience that requires zero input from a phone or any other device. To get started, just strap the headset on, turn it on, and go. There's literally nothing else to do, and the battery inside runs for several hours before needing a charge, making long VR sessions or even VR group gaming a reality. Just make sure they don't get too sweaty though, because these pads don't come off and they can get pretty gross. We've got a number of titles to work with for the review, and Lenovo is citing that 70 titles officially support the new 6 Degrees of Freedom movement at launch, plus of course capability with all 350 Daydream titles on the Play Store. What's rather cool is the ability to enable 6 Degrees of Freedom movement in any Daydream title, which adds a brand new dimension to your favorite Daydream games and works incredibly well in everything we tested. This finally opens up the dimension of movement that mobile VR has been missing since its inception and really changes the game in most ways. This is certainly the easy VR experience that many people have been looking for, and without needing extra equipment makes the cost and ease of ownership considerably more attractive than past efforts. There's no denying the attraction that the Oculus Go's price tag represents, or simply dropping a Gear VR or Daydream View on your existing phone for even less. And while we really want to buy into Lenovo's vision for mobile VR, the lack of proper motion controllers ultimately makes us a hard buy at $399. If that were included, it would certainly make the headset a great buy, as Daydream support continues to grow all the time, and the capability of a truly mobile, room-scale VR solution really is finally within our grasp with this headset. Here's hoping for those controllers sometime soon, because aside from needing a more portable form factor, it's really all that's missing from giving the freedom to truly enter the virtual world, no matter where you're at. We hope you enjoyed that review and will subscribe to us for regularly updated content. Chat with us on your favorite social media network, and don't forget to check out AndroidHeadlines.com for 24-7 tech news coverage. Thanks for watching, and until next time.